So again, this is very brief, but it's just an aim to give a little bit of a panorama of who's out there. And I'm basically going to talk at the world level because on this continent, I basically don't know who's playing the game well enough in any one of your countries. You know, Jean, I know you from Benin. I know a couple good young scientists from Benin, and that's it. But I don't know who the players are, right? I don't know who's, who's at the table playing the game. And the same would go for, for every other country represented around the table. So I'm going to talk about this at the global level. And my hope is that talking about the global alphabet soup might be informative when you guys interface with the global, but also as you think about the alphabet soup within your country or within your continent. So there's some really interesting generic efforts. This is a very interesting one. It's called Dryad. And it's a curated general purpose repository that makes the data underlying scientific publications discoverable, reusable, and citable. Really interesting. How many times have you gotten interested in a paper, read it, read it again, read the methods because you're really interested, and then you realize, oh, I can't replicate this because the data are proprietary. Maybe the person has the data closed up on a computer somewhere, or the data are hard to replicate, or you don't know exactly what was done to process those data. So I'm becoming a big fan of these kind of generic repositories. And in the biggest picture, every single thing that we do in science should be backed up by a repository of data and also a repository of tools and workflows. But let's, let's come a little bit more specifically to biodiversity informatics. I sent you guys this paper. It's basically a group of friends who sat down. It, was actually, it actually started with Jorge, Sandy, and me sitting in a pub in London uh, at the, what was it, eBiosphere meetings. Okay, one of those meetings. <laughs> so essentially we just asked, what are the big questions? Because in some ways, biodiversity informatics was just something that happened and kind of by accident. And there wasn't an overarching set of questions. Maybe my overarching questions are, why are species where they are? But maybe another person's set of questions has to do with phylogenetic history. But we're all kind of jumbled together in this thing called biodiversity informatics. So I've already shown you this, this diagram once. Um, and essentially all it is is it's one possible framework for organizing your thinking about biodiversity and the information about biodiversity. So we have this, in blue, this kind of panorama of the organization of life as genotypes and phenotypes and interactions amongst different phenotypes and the environment and then humans in there and the biodiversity loss that humans cause. And then these in yellow are kind of the, the types of information that you could assemble that are relevant to these different things. So for example, genotype and phenotype, we process into hypotheses about the evolutionary history of life. Or we can put together information about geographic distributions, environment, human effects, biodiversity loss, and we can make guesses, predictions about change. Right? So this is, this is just one schema. But what I wanted to do was to start putting some of the initiatives on this panorama for you. So for documenting genotypes, 
probably the biggest is, uh, is GenBank. And there's a European initiative and a Japanese initiative. They're pretty well cross-linked and, and overlapped. So, so this is a, a little sub-community. It's actually a huge sub-community uh, that's pretty well integrated. And if you want to know about the genotype associated with some element of biodiversity, you can go and look for it in one or a very few places. Morphology, phenotype is a little harder. And there are a bunch of efforts that are beginning. TraitNet, MorphBank, uh, MorphBank ALA. But these are essentially attempts to describe form, you know, outward manifestation. This is clearly harder because when we're talking about genotypes, it's DNA sequences. It's a language that basically is cast in four letters and three letter words, right? It's pretty easy. It's pretty one dimensional. But when we talk about phenotype, we could be talking about dimensions, you know, linear measurements. We could be talking about coloration. We could be talking about behavior. We could be talking about chemical signatures, et cetera, et cetera. So it gets very complex and very multidimensional. So it's quite understandable that the initiatives to describe the phenotype are a bit behind the ones describing the genotype. Even worse when we talk about biotic interactions. We have one species with one phenotype, another species with another phenotype, and they get together and they interact somehow. Um, I found a couple data sets. Um, I wasn't really convinced by them. For example, Encyclopedia of Life has this biotic interaction uh, database. And to me, the biggest problem is standardization. If you're in the, the occurrence data world, you know about Darwin Core. That was um, a standard that's been developed by a consortium of institutions. Um, the the proto-Darwin Core version was developed at KU. Um, but we have a relatively short list of terms, of you know, fields that you need in your database to describe the occurrence of a species. Describing the interactions between two species is massively more complex. Is the interaction in terms of one organism dying and the other one living? Or one organism getting the piece of food and the other one not? Or is it in terms of lifetime fitness being elevated or, or, or reduced? So it's, again, quite a bit more complex. OK, so let's move farther over here. We get to environment. And all of a sudden, we have a, a great richness of, of information. Global land cover databases, global climate data, um, remotely sensed data. Here we do have a data deluge, okay? In, in the environmental realm, indeed, there are terabytes, petabytes of data flowing by us. And we just have to decide how much of that river we're going to try to grab, okay? There's always more you can do to characterize the environment. When we get to human data, again, there's a lot. We have population databases, uh, land cover and changes to land cover, things like that. So again, we've got a lot, of, a lot of information kind of out here about what's the context in which our organism is existing, okay? When we get out here to biodiversity loss and conservation, well, that's that's the home of the biodiversity initiative game, right? And so, you know, UN's environmental program, the Red List, the Hotspots, BirdLife International, Conservation International, NatureServe, TNC, Sierra Club, this, that, and the other. 
it's the initiative game, okay? And it's always new and improved. Some of them are smoke and mirrors, and some of them are substance. I applaud the substance ones, and I abhor the smoke and mirror ones. When we get to forecasts of change, that's where we've got some very useful information, um, a very, very exemplary source is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. What I love about them is that they've done very well that, that uh, transparency that I talked about. There's always the primary data. For them, primary data are model outputs, okay? Mo climate model outputs. And you can go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into their data. You can go down to the, the model outputs for what will be happening globally every six minutes, 50 years from now. Okay, it's, it's just model output. It's not real, but it may tell us something about reality. Um, but there's data, and at the same time, there's really nice synthesis of, un of information. There's the four volume set if you really want the details, or there's the executive summary if you really want the essence. So congratulations. I mean, to me, if I've got to pick one of these initiatives as my, my favorite, it's going to be IPCC. Chris, you won't like this, but the CBD actually does have some um, future biodiversity scenarios. They're kind of in the more of the form of PDF documents. So, you know, go and check them out. See what you think of them. Let's keep going. Um, range maps and geographic distributions. There's the red list, okay, by IUCN, and BirdLife runs the bird part of it. And there's Mapping Life, or Map of Life. It has a couple different names. Well, awfully interesting. Go to those pages, okay? Go look at the red list. Find some endangered species and try to get some primary data out of it. Not secondary data, not a status assessment, not a trend, not a description, not a map, but the primary data. Try it. Okay? And to my great disappointment, at least the last time I visited the site, Map of Life doesn't allow data download in any sense. I can't find the button. But there we have sources of information. For taxonomy, there have been quite a number of initiatives. Um, ITIS is a North American thing. Species 2000, Catalog of Life, and several other initiatives that are essentially attempting to lay out the list of species on Earth. I heard about a recent effort that's being assembled and is now funded to put together a list of all plant species on Earth. And I've heard rumors that it might not be open access. What a dumb idea. And then for phylogenetic trees, uh, there's tree base and a couple other initiatives. So essentially what I wanted to do was to give you a tour, oops, sorry. <laughs> Tell me when those things happen. I wanted to give you a little bit of a tour of this huge alphabet soup because it can be awfully hard to figure out, in essence, what's the contribution of each of these initiatives. And clearly I've misclassified things, I've oversimplified, I've left out some important initiatives, no doubt about it. Let's take one. This is kind of the realm where I feel like you know, I, I, I might have a little bit of expertise. Let's talk about data about geographic distributions. 
primary data about geographic distributions. Just for that realm, here's all the initiatives. So Chris and I cut our teeth in this field in North American Biodiversity Information Network. Jorge was also participating in that. That one's deceased, but it's deceased for a good reason. Other good things grew out of it, and we literally killed it. Okay? But then we get to some greater complexity. After NABIN, Chris already told you a bit about this, uh, the National Science Foundation first funded MANUS, and then HERPNET, and then in the same year, ORNUS and FISHNET too. So four large-scale uh, grants from our National Science Foundation amounted to several million dollars. Each one of these initiatives brought kind of 30 to 50 data holders into a community. So I co-ran Ornus, and I think it was 38 data providers that we promised to bring in. And in the end, we, we brought in something like 60. Um, NSF grants can't run more than five years. And so each of these grants ran its five years, and eventually the funding expires. So as these grants got old, we created VertNet. Because the institutions were the bird collection at the University of Kansas, the mammal collection at the University of Kansas, the herb collection, and the fish collection at the University of Kansas. Why do we need to have four initiatives to deal with one? So we assembled VertNet, and it presently is funded by the National Science Foundation. And so over the next few years, we're going to decease FishNet, Manus, HerpNet, and Ornus. Another outgrowth of that early activity was GBIF. Okay, there was a critical technology called Digger that made GBIF's activities possible. Another outgrowth more recently is this thing called Bison. Um, and then we have parallel efforts that appear some early, like Species Link from Kriya, which was Banderley's work, his team, Sandy, its networks, Conabio, et cetera, et cetera, Atlas of Living Australia. So a lot of these efforts kind of arise and grow in parallel. Many of the things on this page, on this screen, are not smoke and mirrors. A few are smoke and mirrors, okay? And you think I'm gonna go and identify them, right? No, I'm gonna be good this time. And then there's another level. I gave you that whole panorama that went from genes to ecosystems to, to change caused by humans and all of the real data that come out of it. But then we get into these other things. You know, this is, the CBD is explicitly a policy entity, right? The IUCN is a conservation threat entity. IPBES. I'm not going to say anything more about it. You, you decide based on what I showed you. We have what are called the bingos, the big NGOs, B-I-N-G-O. Um, there's this thing called the Biodiversity Knowledge Commons. Google it. It existed for about 15 minutes. Somebody had this bright idea. It was new and improved, the biodiversity in knowledge commons, and then it disappeared. So again, what I'm after is when you see these initiatives, when you're approached, when you see something, when you run into something, when there's a proposal, look at it 
critically and say, what does this really do? You know, there, were, there, were a, there was an old set of um, commercials from a hamburger chain called Wendy's in the US. And there was this little old woman and she was biting into a hamburger at some other chain's um, store. She'd bite in and it's all bread. And so in her little old woman voice, she'd say, where's the beef? Where, where, where's the meat? And so that's what I want you to do with these initiatives, with the biodiversity initiative game. I want you always to ask, where's the beef? So conclusions. Biodiversity information and biodiversity related information are complex and multidimensional. You know that. The landscape of initiatives and programs is extremely crowded, tends to be very overlapping, and it tends to be very ephemeral and changeable. And sorting out which are the real, substantive, concrete, positive, community-oriented, science-based efforts is not easy. That's the only conclusion I can take you to. So that's comment number two. Okay, 